Okay, so we're going to do the stratospheric ozone problem today. And these are the, the, new, the new terminology that you should be aware of. So we'll talk about the ozone layer and then the, um, the ozone hole. The Dobson unit I'll discuss, I'll define as a measure of column integrated ozone concentration. We'll be talking about CFCs, which um, had been used as the primary uh, liquid in uh, refrigerators. And you, you need to have a fluid that flows back and forth uh, between the cold sink and the warm sink in a refrigerator. And uh, CFCs was the common uh, chemical to do that. Uh, but now they've been replaced largely by HCFCs, the hydrofluorochlorb Fluoro, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, say that 10 times fast. And um, so I'll define those as well. We'll talk at some point today about polar stratospheric clouds, catalytic reactions, which are reactions in which um, one particular chemical compound allows the reaction to go forward, but in the end itself isn't changed. So it can be reused over and over again to make the same chemical cycle go forward. Photochemical reactions, which are chemical reactions that involve light. You have to have photons of light in order for that reaction to go forward. And we'll talk about the Montreal Protocol. So all this will come in turn today. Uh, first of all, so I showed this diagram last time and we, as we discussed uh, this part of the ozone issue. But now we're going to talk about the ozone layer. And as it says here, it contains 90% of the atmospheric ozone. So if you do a column integration from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom, most of the contribution comes from the um, ozone layer. What's uh, plotted here is the partial pressure of ozone in, in millipascals. Um, remember that the, the total pressure, the air pressure, uh, decreases strongly and exponentially all the way on up through the troposphere and the stratosphere. So this has a very different vertical structure than the total, uh, the total air pressure. The, it has a beneficial role. It acts as a shield against um, ultraviolet radiation that would otherwise cause uh, skin cancer, skin damage. And the current trends are a long-term global downtrend in stratospheric ozone. And, um, and then, uh, most famously, this ozone hole, which occurs uh, in the springtime of the Antarctic uh, part of the Earth each, um, each year. And then some more recent discussion about possibly this starting up in the northern hemisphere as well, but this is not as well documented. So um, just a couple calculations then. So, I want to um, compute the mixing ratio of PPMV for ozone to air using this point on this slide. So I'm going to say that that at about 24 kilometers altitude, you've got a partial pressure of ozone that's about 30 millipascals. And I want to convert that to a mixing ratio because that's what we're we've been used to using, what we used last time. So first of all, uh, because it's going to be a mixing ratio, I need to know how much air is up there as well. Not just how much ozone, but how much air. So I'm going to use this simple formula that we've used quite often in the course. It's the um, approximate uh, exponential form for pressure as a function of altitude, um, where you use a uh, scale height, h sub s. You know the pressure at the surface of the Earth, you know the altitude you're inquiring about, and this will give you the pressure at that altitude. So um, sea level pressure we'll take to be 1,013 millibars, which is the standard average value. Convert that to pascals. The scale height, as you recall, is RT over G, which is about 8,400 meters for the, um, the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere. So I'll put um, 24 kilometers up here, that scale height here, and I'll put the the uh, sea level pressure there, and that's this formula here. So I've put everything in where I said I would, and I get a value of about 6,000 pascals 
for the air pressure up, up here. And then um, I can simply put that into a ratio of the two pressures um, to get the, the mixing ratio in the common unit. So I put in that uh, value of um, 30 over uh, uh, 0.03 over 6,000, I get 20 ppmv for the ozone mixing ratio in the peak of the ozone layer. Okay? Pretty straightforward calculation. Had to find out how much air was there and then form the proper ratio and get it in the proper units. Now, compare this with what we were talking about last time. The EPA one hour standard for ozone in the boundary layer, where, where we live, was 0.12 in those same units. So uh, the ozone concentration in the ozone layer is about 200 times the EPA one hour limit, just to give you a, a relative sense for that. So um, if we were up there, that would be really tough for us to breathe that in. Now remember, however, there's not enough air to keep us alive anyway at those altitudes, but um, the ozone concentration is quite large as well. So that's an inho inhospitable environment up there at that altitude. Any questions on that? Um, but it is possible, or it wasn't until recently possible, for us to fly at those altitudes. Um, so uh, the Concorde, this beautiful supersonic uh, commercial airliner, which stopped flying a couple of years ago, uh, it flew at an altitude typically of 17 kilometers, which isn't quite at the peak of the ozone concentration, but it's definitely up in the ozone layer. There's no doubt about that. And of course, you have to refresh the cabin air. You can't just lock the cabin doors and expect everybody to live off that cabin air until you get to your destination. So your aircraft can continually draw in air from outside uh, to flush the cabin and give you fresh cabin air. The question is, how do you do that in this case? Um, remember, though, that there's two problems. First of all, there's very little air outside anyway, so you're going to have to compress it with some kind of a pump uh, before you can put it into the cabin so people can breathe it. And um, that's going to be a big compression. Let's just think about um, this for a minute. So if you're flying at 17 kilometers and um, you want to get that air compressed to cabin pressure, well, first of all, what cabin pressure do you normally have? Um, airliners don't usually keep you at sea level pressure. If you're taking off from New York City, uh, as you take off, the pressure will drop as you, in the cabin will drop as you climb, but they'll usually only let it drop um, to maybe an equivalent altitude of 6,000 feet, something like that. And then they couldn't let it go any lower or you'd start to have trouble breathing, but, uh, but they don't keep you at sea level. Uh, so let's, I'm going I'm to assume that the, uh, for this calculation, that the um, aircraft, the cabin altitude, what's called the cabin altitude, is going to be kept at two kilometers. It's about 6,000 feet above the surface. In, flat, in fact, you're flying at 17 kilometers, so you've got to take air and compress it just as you would if you took a parcel of air from 17 kilometers and brought it down to two kilometers. It would compress, adiabatic compression. We've talked about this over and over again. And it would heat as you compress it. So when you put it into that pump and compress it, uh, it's going to warm up. And how much? Well, this is a calculation you can do in your head. You know the adiabatic um, lapse rate is about 10 degrees per kilometer. Actually, it's 9.8, but I've rounded it off. That's a difference in 15 kilometers. So essentially, you're going to get 150 degrees Celsius warming when you compress that air, uh, about ready to put it into the cabin. Now you're going to um, it started off pretty cold, but still, that's going to be really hot air. Um, two things i got to say about that. First of all, the convenient thing is that that temperature will destroy the ozone. So just by compressing the air, getting it ready to put into the cabin, you're going to kill off that ozone automatically. So that's pretty convenient. 
But then remember, you're going to have to cool it a bit before you put it into the atmosphere, in, into the cabin. So you're going to put it through another heat exchanger, cool it back down, and then you'll get the air to stick into the cabin. Um, if you don't get it all out, you can pass the air through a activated charcoal filter, and that will remove any remaining ozone that's in the air before you put it into the cabin. So it is possible to fly at those altitudes right in the middle of the ozone layer, but that's how you have to do it. Any questions on that? Yeah? Why would you want to fly at that time? Um, it's, it turns out it has mostly to do with the efficiency of the engines. Uh, in fact, that's true with subsonic aircraft as well. The reason they fly quite high, 35,000 feet, 37,000 feet, is because the engines are most efficient at that altitude. And for this aircraft, the more efficient altitude was even higher uh, at um, 17 kilometers. So, anything on that? Okay, maybe that's a little tangential point, but this thing called the Dobson unit is a um, column density. We could write it, in fact, I wish that they had chosen uh, the unit of kilograms per square meter. You'd simply integrate uh, top to bottom in the atmosphere and say how many kilograms of ozone are there in each square meter of footprint for that column that you've integrated over. But they, for historic reasons, they didn't do it that way. Uh, this is typically measured by uh, looking at light coming from the sun and see how much ultraviolet light reaches the surface of the Earth. And that'll tell you how much ozone there is in the column. Uh, what they're using for the Dobson unit is this definition. It's one milliatmosphere centimeters. That's the scientific definition of a Dobson unit. And here's how you think about that. You take all the ozone in the column, you compress it to standard temperature and pressure. That is one atmosphere of pressure and zero degrees Celsius. And then you measure how thick that layer would be composed just of ozone. And you measure that in thousandth of a centimeter. And that is your Dobson unit value. Um, and I'll be showing you this kind of data. Typical values for the Earth atmosphere run from 100 to 500 Dobson units, depending where you are around the world. But that's, um, that is normally, the Dobson unit is what we use to describe to each other how much uh, ozone there is in the atmosphere. So for example, you'll see a diagram like this from NASA. Um, it's a map of the world. Some areas blocked out because they don't have data from here. Uh, for this particular time of year. But um, the scale is in Dobson units. So uh, in the tropical regions, you're getting values about 250, 260 Dobson units. In the green, you're getting values maybe 325, maybe in some areas even 350 or 360. So that's the way we represent column integrated ozone in, um, on this, in this uh, subject. We can also get vertical profile information, uh, either by direct in situ measurements or by looking at light passing across uh, the, Earth, uh, the Earth's atmosphere horizontally. This gives you some idea where the ozone layer is as a function of latitude. So here's latitude, north pole, south pole, equator, altitude. But notice the offset zero. This isn't the ground. This is starting at 16 kilometers, right? Um, so the ozone layer. Uh, it at higher latitudes is at an altitude of about, it peaks at an altitude of about, well, 20 kilometers, 18, 19, 20 kilometers. But near the equator, it's up around 25, 26 kilometers. I think we expected this because remember the tropopause has this same kind of a structure. It's higher in the equatorial regions and lower in the polar regions. And so um, the ozone layer is about the same place in the stratosphere, but the stratosphere starts at a different level. So, so it's lifted, in a sense, relative to the surface of the Earth in the, um, in the um, equatorial latitudes. The reason why, uh, part of the reason why there is that difference is because of a, a broad circulation that takes place in the stratosphere called, called the Brewer-Dobson circulation, which I won't talk about, but 
this artist has reminded us that there is this broad, slow circulation in the stratosphere. So what, um, why do we have ozone in the stratosphere? This is the basic chemistry of that. Um, we know we have a lot of O2 in our atmosphere. It's the second most common molecule. And occasionally, a high-energy photon will come from the sun. A high-energy ultraviolet photon will dissociate that uh, diatomic oxygen into two oxygen atoms. Doesn't happen very often because it needs a high energy photon to do that. But then you've got some free oxygen atoms floating around. And when you have that, that'll quickly combine with an O2 molecule to form ozone. That's a fast reaction. But equally fast is that other ultraviolet photons, they don't have to be as energetic as this one. Uh, these can be in the near in the near, um, or the UVA, for example, the near ultraviolet, will uh, dissociate that back to this again, and that's fast. So uh, what you've got is a rapid recycling going on uh, between that and that uh, that's just going on all the time in the uh, stratosphere, but maintaining um, a balance here. Now, occasionally, an ozone will interact with one of these atoms and go back to O2 which is the common form, and then you've lost it, right? So um, you've lost the, uh, the ozone permanently, or at least quasi-permanently. So the ozone concentration is controlled by ignoring this rapid cycling, which doesn't have any, uh, any long-term effect. It's controlled by the balance of these two slow processes. How often are you producing oxygen atoms, and how often are you removing uh, ozone and oxidants back to O2. And that, that would be occurring naturally because we have oxygen in the atmosphere and we have ultra light, ultraviolet light coming <coughs> from the sun. So that's the, that's the background to why there is ozone in the stratosphere. The reason why it doesn't happen further down is because most of these ultraviolet photons are absorbed up there and don't get, don't penetrate deeper into the atmosphere. So it's a layer up there because that's where these ultraviolet uh, photons are being absorbed and doing this work, causing these photochemical reactions to take place. Questions on that? Yeah. I'm curious if there is some sort of feedback mechanism or if the two slow reactions are interconnected in some way, because I guess if you have more free oxygen atoms, that would allow the second Well, you'd have to write down the rate equations for these to, to answer that question, which I'm not prepared to do. But um, this obviously will, you know, a chemical reaction depends on the rate at which it goes forward depends on how much of this you do you have and how much of this do you have and how often are they colliding to allow the reaction to go forward. So if you're, I think your instinct is right that these are going to depend on the concentrations that you have. So just like our tank experiment, the loss rate was proportional to how much you have. And that's what, in a system like this, where the, uh, the generation term is independent of how much of this you have, but the loss rate is proportional, you're going to come to an equilibrium, just like we did in the water tank. And that's what I'm implying here, that you've got that kind of balance between a source, which is just there, and then a sink, which is dependent on how much you have. And that will give a natural equilibrium eventually. And this is a cartoon uh, showing that. So um, the sun is playing a role. Uh, occasionally, it will uh, dissociate O2 to form a symbol O, a O molecule. And then you get this rapid recycling between oxygen atoms and ozone. And then occasionally, you'll go back just to the O2 again. And the control of how much you have is primarily these processes not this. This is just a rapid recycling of the two types of odd oxygen. Now, to remind you about the um, spectrum of radiation coming from the sun, I show you this. You've seen it before. The visible spectrum is here, the infrared. We're really interested in the ultraviolet over here in today's, 
today's conversation, which starts at 400 nanometers wavelength and goes shorter than that. And um, these standard definitions are helpful. UVA are the wavelengths closest to the visible, closest to the blue, defined as going from 400 to 315 nanometers. UVB, 315 to 280, and then UVC, 280 all the way down to 100 nanometers. Now, you may remember from physics that the shorter wavelength photons are more energetic. They'll do more damage. So um, UVA would cause tanning of your skin, but probably wouldn't give you skin cancer. UVB might, but UVC is very damaging. In fact, it's used in doctor's offices to clean um, uh, surgical tools. You put it into this uh, autoclave, which will put UVC on your instruments, and it'll kill anything that's there very, very quickly. It's very damaging, very damaging radiation. And so here's the fate of UVA, UVB, and UVC. Uh, some UVA comes through. Um, half or more of the UVB is absorbed in the ozone layer. So plotted on top of this, this is altitude um, and uh, Dobson units per kilometer to get where the ozone layer is. Uh, so about half or two-thirds of the UVB is absorbed by the ozone and almost all, thankfully, almost all of the UVC coming from the sun is absorbed by the ozone layer. So it's a very good protective shield for us. Now, what could be, what could be changing this natural um, ozone layer situation? Well, this is the current theory for it, that um, it involves a catalytic reaction primarily using chlorine atoms. Now, bromine will do this as well, and there's some bromine in the atmosphere, but I'm going to focus strictly on the chlorine. And notice how this reaction works. So you have a chlorine atom reacting with an ozone molecule. It goes to ClO. It oxidizes the chlorine and gives you back O2. And then quite soon after that, you'll take this ClO and react it with another ozone molecule. That'll give you back the Cl that you started with, and you have two O2s, two regular diatomic oxygens. So look, the ozone is gone. In fact, two ozones are gone. And you've got your Cl back ready to do it again. So this is a catalytic reaction where the catalyst here is the chlorine atom. It can be used over and over again to destroy ozone molecules in this way. Two ozone molecules are lost, and the catalyst is free, ready to go back and do it again. That's the idea of what's today, now that we have a, a, a measurable chlorine concentration in the atmosphere, this is why we think the ozone layer is decreasing. Questions on that? So um, up here in the inset is the emission. This is an example, CFC 11, um, one of the chlorofluorocarbon, of chlorofluoro carbons. And here's the emission rate for it in megatons per year, starting in 1960, going up to year, the year 2000. So you see there was a rapid rise in it as it was being used in refrigeration. And when you put it into a, a refrigerator, it may be contained for a few years, but eventually it leaks out or someone tosses away the refrigerator and it, it gets a leak and it goes to the atmosphere. So almost everything you produce eventually makes its way into the atmosphere. Uh, the Montreal Protocol that I'll talk about was here, where you begin to see finally it decreased. But uh, because it's a long-lived molecule, here's the CFC abundance in the atmosphere. It increased through this period of time. We've stopped putting it in, but it's still there. It has a lifetime. From this date, it looks like the lifetime is about 50 years. And so it's going to take probably another 50 or 100 years before we see 
much of a decline. Thank goodness we've stopped putting it in, um, but it's not going to decrease to zero just because we've stopped putting in. It's going to be stored in the atmosphere for a while. It has a long, has a long lifetime. The uh, circles are data from the northern hemisphere, and the triangles are data from the southern hemisphere. But they're, they're pretty much the same. So the two hemispheres, uh, the, the, this stuff gets mixed back and forth. Probably most of it was put into the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere, uh, but now it's mixed to be uh, pretty much equal in the two hemispheres. Questions on that? Um, here is the global averaged total ozone change in percent starting back in 1965. Around 1980 is when we began to see the rapid decrease. But it's not huge. Notice that it's leveled out today, and it's only about 4% below where it started. So this global decrease in ozone is, uh, I suppose it's something we should be concerned about, but it's not a huge factor. And it doesn't look like it's going to get any worse now that we've stopped putting CFCs into the atmosphere. So it's a concern, but not, I would say, a terribly uh, difficult one. But then there's this ozone hole that I'll spend the rest of the time talking about. And here is what it looked like a couple of days ago. Um, you can go to this website, which I'm just about to do. I should have set this up before. Um, but here's a definition of it. So uh, it's a brief seasonal and local reduction in ozone. Location is Antarctica. The time of year that it happens each year is September, October. It first appeared in about 1978. It wasn't, apparently, it wasn't happening before then. It was discovered in 1984. And then uh, going back and looking at old data, they found that it actually had started some six years earlier than that. Uh, the discovery of the depletion mechanism by Bolina and Crutzen uh, was a rather remarkable scientific discovery. I'll, I'll give you hints of how that went in just a minute. And they won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for that, awarded in 1995 from that discovery of how the ozone depletion mechanism works. Ultimately, it's caused by these CFC emissions, which then led to the Montreal Protocol, which I'll talk briefly about, a rather successful international treaty to limit the emissions of CFCs. Here's a brief history of it. So at the top is the ozone hole area in millions of square kilometers. What you do is set a threshold for ozone concentration. If it's lower than that, you say you're in the hole. If it's larger than that, you're out of the hole. And then you keep track of that area. And um, the ozone hole was non-existent before 79, but now has reached about um, what the, about 25 million square kilometers. You saw a picture of it. Just, and it's kind of leveled out. It's not getting any better, not getting any worse. And the minimum ozone in the middle of that hole is shown here in Dobson units, of course, uh, getting worse, but now leveling out to a value of about 100 Dobson units in the middle of the hole each year when it, when it forms. So give me just a moment here to bring up this um, website. I forgot to do this before. Um, let's see here. That's not what I want. Let's see. I'll just Google and find it. Um, yeah, that's probably it. That's not the one I want. That's a good one, but it's not the one I'm looking for. I'll try to find this other one. Yeah. Let's do an animation uh, for uh, this season. Yeah, so this is this year's ozone hole. It hasn't formed yet. We're back in July. This is Antarctica sitting there waiting. Now, where do we get into September? We'll begin. It's already beginning to form it in the late summer, but now we're getting the ozone hole forming. 
October, peaks in October, and then it'll start to fill in up to the present date. It's starting to weaken now that we're into November. So that's the deal. It happens every year in that region. You get this large area that forms with uh, about half the ozone it would otherwise have. The, the de ozone depletion is about 50 percent in that region, compared to, remember, only 4 percent globally. So this is a localized, um, a localized anomaly. You can go to that website yourself and do some other animations. So in this year, then, this tracks it. Uh, the ozone hole area climbed up to um, the 12th of September. Now it's decreased. Um, the minimum ozone dropped to a minimum. Now it's increasing now that we're into, into November. And I'm going to be talking about this stratospheric temperature. Stratospheric temperature in that part of the world now at that altitude is beginning to climb because we're getting out of their winter and towards their southern hemisphere summer. And I'll come back to talk about the role of temperature in just a moment. So I think the most curious thing about the ozone hole is why only in September and October? Why just over the South Pole? And I guess what is the link to human activity? So there's a lot of natural processes and factors controlling this. And then there's the added impact of humans. And somehow they have all come together to form this curious phenomena of the ozone hole. And the few minutes I have left, I want to just try to explain some of that. Um, now, I hope you can see this. I'll read it, I'll read it um, through for you. Um, this is a seasonal cycle of temperature in the stratosphere. And um, this is for 90 north to 65 north. So this is the north polar cap. This is 25 north to 25 south, so this is the equatorial region. And this is 65 south to 90 south, so this is the south polar region. Now, um, the temperatures in the northern hemisphere get down to minus 70 on occasion. These are at different altitudes, I believe. I'm having trouble reading those. Um, they get down to about minus 70. In the equatorial regions, those temperatures get down to about minus 75. But here in the South Pole, they get down to minus 80 and even minus 85. So of all the places in the world's stratosphere, the southern hemisphere polar stratosphere, that is over Antarctica, has a wintertime temperature colder than any other place on the planet. That's one of the things that makes it special in regards to why the ozone hole forms there. Now, why would that be? It has to do with the phenomena of polar stratospheric clouds, abbreviation PSCs, polar stratospheric clouds. I haven't spoken about these in the course up to this present time, so this is new, new material. These are ice clouds um, that form up in the stratosphere. Normally, we think clouds don't form in the stratosphere. It's pretty dry up there. But these clouds do. Um, they are not entirely made of water. They're a mixture of water and nitric acid in these clouds. And they require an extraordinarily cold temperature in order to form. Temperatures colder than minus 70 degrees Celsius. Some would say even colder than that. This is probably why. The Antarctic stratosphere uh, is so special because its temperature gets cold enough in winter to allow these polar stratospheric clouds to occur, whereas other places around the globe in the stratosphere, you don't get those clouds. What do they do then? What, what, how do they uh, influence ozone? Well, uh, these ice clouds, these ice particles, freeze up uh, diatomic chlorine by holding the nitric acid in the ice itself. In other words, when it forms, it's storing HNO3, nitric acid. And here's the reaction. You start with HCl and ClONO2. Reaction goes to Cl2, 
2 and um, the nitric acid, and then this is locked up in the ice. So what you've done, you had your chlorine locked up in HCl and in this compound. There's chlorines in both. Now you've put the nitric acid in the ice and you've freed up the chlorine diatomic molecule. There's only one step to go. When the light returns, remember, that minimum of temperature occurred in perpetual darkness. At that season of the year, it's dark over Antarctica. There's no light. So you can get the ice forming. You can get the seal all ready to go, but it's in the diatomic form. Then the light comes back, southern hemisphere spring. The light comes back. You can dissociate the Cl2 to form two Cl molecules and then go back a few slides to that catalytic reaction and it starts. It starts to destroy ozone. So you get that? So the ice frees up the chlorine. It then dissociates when light returns and the catalytic destruction of ozone begins to take place and the ozone hole forms. Uh, that's why it occurs where it does and when it does because of that necessary condition for cold. And then the ozone hole forms just after the light returns to that, to that region. Any questions on that? Yes. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's the way the chlorine is stored most of the time in the stratosphere is in these two molecules. After, it, after the CFCs break down, the chlorine is transferred into these two forms and just hangs around. Then the PSCs form and that sucks off the nitric acid and the CL is released. So this is the storage form of the chlorine during most of the year in the stratosphere. Not, not, not naturally. Remember this, this, um, I know this was CFCs and not chlorine, um, and that's a critical difference, but let me just go back to that. There were no CFCs in um, the atmosphere before that. There probably was a little bit of chlorine, but only a very small amount, but now we're, we're putting it in through this CFC source. Sorry, that's not a complete answer, but that's the best I can do. So uh, I think this is, well, yeah, this is the last one. So the Montreal Protocol, the full name of it is Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer. It's an international treaty. Um, and uh, of course, it was first signed in Montreal. It's got the name. Since then, it's been modified several times. Um, certain forms of... Uh, of uh, substances have been added to the banned list. Others have been allowed, so it's been modified a few times. Uh, generally, what it did is, by the time uh, we came to 1994, it had banned pretty much all emissions of CFCs into the atmosphere. It largely replaced them with the uh, HCFC, which can also be used as a refrigerant, but has a much shorter lifetime and will not cause the chlorine to build up in the atmosphere. It may have some other problems. It may be a greenhouse gas, but um, it doesn't have the problem of putting permanently chlorine into the atmosphere the way that the CFCs do. Now, the, um, one of the reasons why this treaty was signed, because the, as you could expect, the um, refrigerant industry uh, vigorously opposed this, was at about the time it was signed, DuPont, which was the, this large chemical company and the world's largest producer of CSEs, discovered a replacement for it. And they realized that they would not lose their business because they had a replacement ready to go. And they might even be able to make more money by doing this changeover to a different type of refrigerant. So in the end, they dropped their opposition and uh, uh, many countries of the world got together and signed this international treaty. And it's viewed in environmental circles as being uh, one of the best examples of a successful um, 
a situation where the scientists um, discovered the problem, suggested how to solve it, and then you had the countries of the world actually getting together to pass a treaty and acting on it. As you saw, the uh, CFC emissions have dropped nearly, nearly to zero now. So uh, it's looked at as, in, well, in some cases, as um, in, in wonderment, because how, you know, could we do something like this today? It's not clear, but at least we have this example of how environmental uh, science can, can prevent these problems. Uh, any questions on this? Great, we're done a little bit early again today, so enjoy your uh, Thanksgiving break, and I'll see you a week from Monday. <laughs>